I built a fire on a beach and why? Because I like it. I love the structure, I love the warmth, I love all that mechanics of it. And it feels like a really elemental thing. It feels like this is what we all need to do and we all, it's somehow it's programmed inside. There's something that draws people to a fire. It's a real social thing. But we need to tame this power and bring it into the home so we can use it. So this fireside tale tells how we've tamed the power of that raging beast to bring heat and light into our homes. It begins at the dawn of civilization. I've flown up to the magnificent Orkney Islands off the north of Scotland to 5,000 year old Scarra Bray to see what happened when we first invited the fire into our homes. Well, welcome to Fred Flintstone's house. It's actually, in estate agent terms, needs a little attention. But the features of a modern house are, are really here, except that the fire's in the middle. This is the centre of the whole existence. It cooks, it lights, it keeps everybody warm. This was the centre of the house, the hearth. The old Latin word for hearth is focus. That's where we get centre, focus from. But right by the fire, and logical really if you want to stay warm at night, is a fitted bed and this would be lined with moss and fur and grass, uh, a Stone Age duvet really. As a designer and problem solver, I'm impressed by the layout of these rooms and how much we can still learn from them today. The whole thing is quiet and peaceful and, and sheltered from the outside by these big thick walls. Nice design really, but there's one thing missing. Let me show you. So here's our Stone Age house, all nice and cosy, fire in the middle, except it's not cosy, there's no roof, we better put one on. Got a few timbers on there, but this is the Orkney Islands, there's no timber, there's no trees. So they use whale bones and then put some sort of hides or sheeting material, it would have been hides, that's all they've got, followed by big lumps of turf, the same turf probably that they used to use to burn in the fire. There's the walls at the side. And here's our fire down there. Look, there's the fireplace. Everything's around the fireplace. So we'll put a couple of characters in. A couple of, put, put a couple of Neolithic types in. Neolithic nose, Neolithic hairdo. Hi, can you see that? I don't, I don't know if I can see it. But anyway, there's another one. Put that little eye in. They're all over the place. They're wild, these people. But it wasn't a wild civilization. This is a nice little dwelling. Here's the fire. Fire, fire. Lots of smoke, lots of smoke. Look, it heats the whole room. But we've just covered it, we've covered it up with a roof. Where does that smoke go? I don't see any evidence of a chimney. Of course there isn't. There's no chimney here. What must it really have been like to live in this sort of situation before somebody invented some technology to get rid of the smoke? A few thousand years on, and Orkney crofters used all sorts of technology in their cottages. And not just to get rid of smoke. The fire is still central, but built high against a brick wall, the beginnings of the fireplace and they had other lateral thinking ideas to maximise their comfort. I'm bringing a supplementary heat source into an ancient Orkney croft. So is it really an extra heat source? Oh yes, oh yes. They had sheep and cattle and occasionally a pig right in a their pig. living quarters. Oh, and there is an enormous amount of heat comes off a cow. Is there? Oh, there is. Uh, thank goodness we couldn't get a cow just now then. Well, I'm, it's quite good with the sheep at the moment. In fact, a pair of sheep each day gives off heat energy equivalent to more than 200 watts. I'd call them a mini version of a two-bar fire. So this is, a, this is the focus of the house in a sense? This is the fire back, which of course heats up and helps to heat up the house. It's your first storage radiator. It was great. <laughs> Principle basic physics works every time. Yes. Smoke's going somewhere. Where's the smoke going? The smoke goes up and finds its way out through the lum. The lum? The lum, which the lum. is not over the fire. No, no. Why because on a very wet day... Why am I asking this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't possibly have a fire under a hole that size. Right. Or you would simply swamp your fire. It's great and cosy, but there's one thing really su surprises me. It's, it's, it's this. What is it? This is the skyline board. A skyline board? A skyline board. And what and does that do? If you lift that up, you'll find that on the that. other end of it oh, yeah. is a board that makes one side of the chimney higher than the other three. Uh, well, and you can move it around. But it can, and I am. <laughs> yes, and it always sits with its back to the wind. Aye. And it's the wind lifting over that board that helps draw the smoke out of the house. It's aeronautics, really. Yes, it? it's aircraft technology, if only they knew it. 
it's a simple solution. It works very, very well. It's, it's why overcomplicate things? And you can see it's the birth of the chimney, really. It's a rudimentary chimney. But the fact that you can control airflow in such a simple way is magic, really. Heating a cosy crofter's cottage is one thing, but things didn't stay quite so modest. And after all, an Englishman's home is his castle. So how would you heat a massive stone structure like this magnificent castle at Skipton? Well, when this castle was built over 900 years ago, the main fuel was timber. And unlike the Orkney Islands, Yorkshire had plenty of trees and plenty of cheap labor to fell them. No trees died needlessly in the making of this program. Trees are a fuel, they're a crop. We're not hurting anybody by doing this. It's a disease tree, it needs to be taken out of the way. And this has gone on for centuries. But as you can see, it's quite big. So all this has got to be converted to a size we can use. This big baronial hall is in actual fact the kitchen, and you'll see that the fireplace has moved down from the middle to the end of the room where you'd expect it into this fireplace. And what a big fireplace this is, because this big log will burn all day down there, and it saves the need for doing lots of sawing and cutting up little logs. But even with a big fire like this, exactly how long will it take to heat a room like this? History books say castles are always cold, but let's see if that's true with some modern temperature measuring equipment. Here's my gizmo here. It's the latest in infrared camera technology and right away with this gizmo I find big generators of hot air. It's the crew. There's the light and what you got there? Coffee. Coffee. Well that obviously is an integral part of castle life. But let's have a look round. It feels chilly, it feels like I'm outside. You might not be able to, well you might not be able to see me breath. What about that Ian? But look at the, the wall there, it's four degrees. If I just whiz over to this log here, take my hand, my hand generates heat, put the hand on top of the log, take it away, residual heat is shown in the log itself and there it is. Isn't that incredible? That's fantastic. After half an hour, the fire is becoming an intense heat source at over 500 degrees. Further away, the bricks have gone up from 5 degrees to the mid-20s. But the fire has a long way to go to heat up all of this drafty hall. I think you'll find the culprit is a little hole in the corner here, which is a medieval toilet. Now, this medieval toilet has obviously got a bit of a cold updraft. Another draft is caused by the fire itself, which loses heat up its own chimney along with the smoke. Chimney design was still very crude in the 15th century, but the basic technology was becoming established. It's cold up on this castle roof. Let me get some of that warmth. You, you warm it up down there? I am, thanks. Go on, tell us how it works. I know you will. Well, it's quite simple, really. I mean, when the wind blows over the top of the chimney, it creates low pressure and literally sucks up the smoke, just like that. And like any piece of technology, when you refine it and actually play around with the shape of the tube, make it smooth or circular, you improve it and it works better. Are you warming up yet? I'm very warm. It's hot here. In fact, let's have a look at some readings, see what this wall was. Now, this wall earlier was in the 30s. Now, it's up in the 90s. Let's check the wall over here. Let's check this one here. And it's 15 there. Despite the cold stone and all the drafts, the hall heated up to a comfortable living temperature in only three hours. And once the stone is warm, it will hold its heat. Imagine a blazing fire in every room in there for 24 hours a day. And you could turn what looks like a big cold store into Yorkshire's biggest Storage radiator. Three hundred years later, in Victorian England, coal was king, and the open fire had evolved into the rage. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire, Jack Frost nibbing at my nose. The early cast iron kitchen range shows the separation of functions between heating, cooking, and boiling. The fire's in its own little box affair, the cooker's in its own little box, that's the oven, 
and the water's there in the kettle and that gives me enough water to fill a nice bath here, right here in the kitchen. And in the days before central heating and hot water on tap, this was the only place in the home to have a nice bath. So let me demonstrate how all this heat can reach every part. Ta -da! I'm a glow all over. I am the god of hellfire, and I bring you fire. We've also managed to take that heat elsewhere in a variety of ingenious ways, from bath time to bedtime, and a clever use of that ability of rock to hold heat. Now, you can, you can get a rock like this and get it warm, get it hot, or a fire brick. You can do this, you can cover it in a cloth, or a towel, or a, or a, a sheepskin. And I've done something similar in my sleeping bag when I've been camping. But in the 1600s, or from the 1600s, a bed warmer like this, might do something similar with the embers from the fire. And in effect, in effect, we get the fire and we take it where it needs to be. And it needs to be in bed. There's nothing more personal heating than heating your bed. Who needs cold feet? So you pop it into bed like this and you can warm all of your bed, not just in one place. As usual, if you had a bit more of an income, there was another way of keeping your bed warm. There was indeed, the woman of the bedchamber. <laughs> The woman of the bedchamber. I should get one of them, I suppose. Go on. Well, of course, you see, I would come to bed about half an hour or maybe more before you in order to warm the bed up for you. Well, that sounds great, but uh, would you have stayed in the bed all night? Oh, no. Your mistress would be here, so I wouldn't be here all the time. No, my truckle bed is under your bed, just here. A truckle bed? Indeed. Well, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> A truckle bed? Well, well, I must get one forthwith. <laughs> now, how would I find someone like you? Well, I'd be a poor relation maybe of your own family, maybe who'd, somebody who'd fallen on hard times a widow and I'd be very grateful for the to the shelter that you would uh, give to me and so I would do you know all the menial tasks in here and the safety was my most important factor here. Well that's what you need a desperate person to keep your bed warm there's absolutely, nothing better. Absolutely. In the 19th and 20th centuries bed warming got a little bit more politically correct. Maybe the days of the professional female bed warmers are over, maybe. But our hot rocks have evolved into an electric rock, which is this ceramic lump here in which you plug in some power for 20 minutes and it gives you heat in the bed for six hours. Warning, this bed warmer must not be placed in the bed with the flexible cord connected. Now, think on. But that shape owes its heritage, its lineage, to this earlier hot water bottle. It's a ceramic bottle with a little filler here. You whiz your hot water in there, boiling water. <laughs> what a thought, if it leaked, will it crack? Boiling water in there and pop that non-cuddleable shape, really, into your bed. So for cuddling purposes, this was evolved. The wonder material rubber had been available since the mid-1800s, looking for uses apart from the tyre. Its flesh-like quality made it a watertight choice for bed warming. In 1943, the electric copy used Bakelite in hard competition. It had a thermostat so it could be used continuously, but the design that eclipsed both of these was made of pressed steel and was out of this world. This little flying saucer, and it was called the flying saucer bed warmer, is actually quite efficient, really. And guess what this is powered by? Photon energy, neutrons. Whoa, nothing more spectacular than a 40 watt bulb. Our ways of keeping warm in bed haven't always been quite so acceptable. Take the electric blanket, for instance. Now, this was a rare and dangerous product really that didn't come into wide acceptance until it was used in the 1920s with tuberculosis patients so they could get fresh air outside while still being warm. Now what a bizarre concept. You're in bed and you're plugged in all that electricity all over the place. I think I've run a few ideas through now I think. It must have been a bizarre situation for people to be in bed and wildlife to be hopping around and birds flying and all that sort of stuff. This is bizarre. Well, they must, it must have worked, we all still use them. Electric blankets have only been called that since the 50s. Before that, names like warming pad or heated quilt were used as they sounded safer. And I can't help thinking that any little accident in the bed in the early days could be somewhat um, shocking. 
The arrival of electricity gave us plenty of options for heat around the home. But fire has always given us light as well as heat. Throughout the 19th century, the gas companies thought their continuous flow of power on tap was the brightest idea. The earliest form of gas light fitting was something like this, and it simply mimics the candle with one flame. But this model from 1820 gives us more light by having all these flames. And what a wonderful light that is. But these beautiful naked flames were inefficient. They wasted heat. By using that heat to make a gauze glow, the gas mantle of 1885 looked like it would be the leading light. We've got a wonderful white light that's given off from its surface. And that surface is a fabric gauze. It's a coated fabric gauze. The mantle even has a sort of dimmer and was invented by Austrian chemist Baron Karl Auer, who found that cotton coated with compounds of cerium and thorium gave off light when they were heated by a flame. It's amazing how much light these three fragile gas mantles can give off. They fully light this little room area here. And light was what the gas companies were all about until the electricity companies came along with the electric light bulb. Big competition. The first electric bulbs arrived in the 1870s after experiments by Joseph Swan and Thomas Edison. But gas had the advantage of already being piped into people's homes. Their gloves were off. Or were they on? The good people at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester have insisted I wear these gloves because I'm about to handle some of their precious objects. And these objects are light bulbs. And some of the most early light bulbs are these two. They're both from around the turn of the century. And that's the 20th century. That's just as old as that one. But it has the familiar shape of the contemporary bulb today. With the bayonet fitting there and the sort of balloon-like shape there. It's carbon, it's got a carbon filament inside. And as the carbon burnt, it tended to fill the bulb with carbon and block out the light. Also, the early carbon filaments burned out in a matter of hours. And the first bulbs cost 25 shillings, about two weeks wages. Not surprisingly, gaslight was shining through as our preferred lighting, particularly as mains electricity was still rare in the early 1900s. Even when we did start to wire up the country, different towns had different voltages, which meant appliances couldn't be standardised or moved around. The electric companies had to innovate, and the breakthrough came when the metal tungsten was used in the filament. Its very high melting point produced bulbs that lasted up to a thousand hours. They even tried wrapping the tungsten bulbs in little lenses to maximise the light. There's one, one bulb they've allowed me to play with, and it's this one. Ah, and it's got this coil, this loop, which gives maximum surface area to allow lots of light to come off it. Now, it looks quite crude, and it's hard to believe that people used to jump for joy at this wonder of the age. The tungsten bulb had finally extinguished the domestic gaslight by the 1930s and it's still the most popular bulb in our homes today. <laughs> wow, amazing. But perhaps we should all be really amazed by this, a very, very low energy light which is almost cold to the touch because it's so efficient. It gives all its energy out as light. This bulb has no filament at all. It's a bent up fluorescent tube using about one fifth of the electricity of a tungsten bulb. And a visit to a high street lighting shop these days shows there's no end to the way we use electric light. All these different designs and styles show me that it's not just a functional thing, it's, a, it's an expression of where we're at, really. It's a, not just the fittings, the light, the quality of light. We paint with light and we flit round these lights like moss round a flame. Having lost the lighting battle, the gas companies had to come up with other appliances that would keep their flame alive. Now, apart from the cooker, they had to think about wild and wacky things that might be powered by gas. And one of them is this, well, is it nautical? Hello there. Ah. Nautical though it may look, it's a hairdryer. There's the heat source, pipe, dry, dry, dry. And over here we've got a what looks like a familiar fridge, but it's gas powered. But my favourite really is the radio. Two pieces of metal in here are heated by a flame, which produces a charge, charges a battery, and that powers the radio. <laughs> 
expensive. As strange though all these products are, gas has stood the test of time. We still heat our homes with it and we can still cook with it, it's nice and controllable. But the light has gone with all the other products. But really, this was the most beautiful and the only source of light for several generations. To get gas to those delicate little lamps, we need slightly beefier engineering. And to begin with, that means pipes. And once upon a time, pipes were made from cast iron or steel. But these days, it tends to be flexible plastic, which is heavy enough in itself. But it doesn't come much beefier than this, this giant tin can. This is our gas holder. And this is where all the gas comes from before it comes to our houses. As the gas flows in, it's just the pressure that holds up the three massive sections. The gas doesn't leak away, as the whole thing sits in a 14 million gallon pool of water. But if you could swim in here, you'd definitely need a gas mask. It's a clever design and I've been proud of myself. Now when gas was manufactured in towns, it was called town gas, that was the only place to put it. But now we get our gas from the North Sea, it comes from the North Sea through pipes into the big tank here and is held in reserve for when it's most needed. When demand is high, the same pipe lets gas out and then overnight it refills again. It really takes hours, but we've gone for some high-speed gas here just to show you the beautiful way the sections screw into each other. It's like a massive piece of kinetic sculpture. Some of these Goliaths are still bobbing up and down after 130 years, whatever the weather. Natural gas really does work for us, but there's one last thing we have to do before it's safer to use in the home. Can I bother you for one minute? Have a smell at that. See what we think that smells like. Ooh. Is it BO? You enjoying it? No, not a lot. Ooh, horrible. <laughs> Go on then, what's your first reaction? <laughs> Quite like it myself. Gas. What I've got in here is a stenchant, and that's added to natural gas because natural gas is odourless, so that if we get a leak, we can smell it, just like the old town gas. Now, my, my reliable source of information is the old Ladybird book, and it says the chemical is tetrahydrothiophene. Can't beat this. Gas proved itself with cooking and heating our whole house. But in the power struggle with electricity, they both transformed our lives. Electrical and other appliances have not only given us portable heat sources, they've given us more time. We no longer have to chop wood or carry coal. We can enjoy products as lifestyle items in themselves. And in the 21st century, the fire itself has become a lifestyle ornament in some homes. This hot designer number will set you back about £5,000. And no, I'm not going to do the line about money to burn. In most modern homes, the open fire is actually out of sight. It's been stuffed in this cupboard. It's central heating. Nice white box, very domestic. Controls, you can hear it now. There's a timer. It'll come on when you want it to and send heat all over the house. Well, usually. Now, all we gotta do is switch the pump on, light the boiler, and retire immediately. <laughs> So perhaps central heating is not quite as straightforward as we may think. And really, I need some people to help me sort this out. And I've got some friends out here in the garden with some plumbing of their own. Skip and brass! <laughs> Fantastic! But let's get some real plumbing. Come on! 
come on, right this way. Oh, what, what tunes we can get out of these things. Come on, man. Marvellous. Ooh, steady. Steady as you go with that one. It's a bit sharp at the top, C sharp, so be careful. Back row of radiators. There you are. Just one or two pipes. Got a piccolo there for you. Turn up the heat. Come on, let's get it going. I've got the boiler here, and the boiler is at the centre of this heating system. It's going to be at the centre of this music. Come on. Are you ready, music makers? Let's go. Let's really turn up that heat, and away we go. Central heating starts with a cold water tank feeding down to the boiler. It's got a pump, computerised timer, thermos... Oh, you don't need to know all this stuff. It's a complicated set of bits that all need to work individually and play their own tune so that the whole thing performs perfectly. A central heating system is just like a band. All components playing in perfect harmony. Fantastic! <laughs> All right, so central heating is modern, convenient, and it's comfortable. But for me, you can't beat the warm glow of an open half fire. It's great. But I've got a bit of a radical theory that maybe there's a new focus of all our homes, really, today. Flaming TV. Make a bonfire of our troubles And we we'll watch them blaze away And when they've all gone Next week, washing machines, kettles, telephones, lawnmowers, all those willing servants around the home in Keeping Life Easy.